In this video, we'll take a look at a piece of vintage Heathkit test equipment, the S3 electronic switch. I'll discuss the history and features of this instrument, and we'll look at the front panel controls and inside circuitry. I'll cover the restoration of the unit and say something about the circuit design it used. We'll see a demonstration of the instrument in operation and then wrap things up with a summary. Heathkit was a manufacturer of electronics in kit form. Their product line included amateur radio, test equipment, and various consumer products. By building a piece of electronics, you could save money and gain the satisfaction of having assembled it yourself. An electronic switch turns a single channel oscilloscope into a multiple channel unit by accepting two input signals and outputting them to a scope as one signal that alternates between the two channels. While not as flexible as a true dual channel scope, it's cheaper than buying a new scope to replace a single channel unit. An electronic switch is one of the less common pieces of test equipment. The name is a bit confusing. There was no general term for these, and while Heathkit called them electronic switches, other manufacturers might call them dual channel adapters or similar terms. The S3 was one of several units made by Heathkit over the years. The first was the S1 offered in 1950. It featured three switching rates and fine rate adjustment. The S2, offered from 1950 to 1955, was similar but built into a different, smaller case. The S3, covered in this video, was offered from 1956 to 1962. As compared to the S2, it added two sync outputs but removed the fine adjustment. My 1959 Heathkit catalog lists it at a price of $21.95. It was followed by the ID-22 sold from 1964 to 1970. It used an identical circuit to the S3, but had different styling as far as color and knobs. The ID-101, offered from 1971 to 1976, was an entirely new solid-state circuit design with different controls. It was styled to match then-current Heathkit test equipment and offered a 5 MHz bandwidth and the ability to run in a bypass mode. The final model offered the ID4101 on the market from 1977 to 1981 was similar if not identical to the ID101 but again changed the style of case and knobs. The S3 provides two inputs, sync outputs for each of the two channels and a single output. The gain of each input can be continuously adjusted from zero to five times. The maximum signal output level is 25 volts peak to peak. It has four fixed switching rates of approximately 150, 500, 1500, and 5000 hertz. It's rated at a frequency response of 0 to 100 kilohertz, plus or minus 1 dB. The input impedance is 100 kilo ohms and output 1000 ohms shunted by 1 nanofarad. It's 9.5 inches wide by 6.5 inches high and 5 inches deep weighs about 8 pounds, and runs on 105 to 125 volts AC, 50 or 60 hertz, taking 30 watts. It was sold as a kit, and assembly requires no calibration. The front panel has binding posts for the A and B input channels, A and B sync outputs, and the switched output to the oscilloscope. Incidentally, Heathkit called these five-way binding posts because they could be used in five ways, with an alligator clip, a banana plug, a test lead pin, a spade lug, or a wire. There are gain controls for each of the A and B inputs, a switch for selecting one of four switching rates, and a position control for adjusting the position of the two traces. There's a power switch and a pilot lamp. The function of the controls will become more apparent later when I get to the demonstration. The circuit is relatively complex using seven tubes, some of which are dual tubes making it equivalent to 11 tubes. The tube lineup is two 12AX7, three 12AU7, one 6C4 and one 6X4. The power supply uses a transformer 
and a 6x4 full-way rectifier with a Pi network consisting of an inductor and three electrolytic capacitors for filtering, producing approximately 300 volts DC. Each input is amplified and buffered with a cathode follower circuit. An amplifier produces each of the two sync outputs. A multivibrator circuit generates a square wave at one of four frequencies which drive switcher circuits for each channel. A cathode follower circuit drives the output. The output is essentially a square wave where each input signal is superimposed on the upper or lower half of the square wave. When displayed on an oscilloscope triggered by one of the input signals, the display appears as two separate traces, one for each input. The position control adjusts the amplitude of the upper and lower portions of the square wave, controlling the relative positions of the two traces. Assembly is typical of the vacuum tube circuits of the era, mounted on a metal chassis with point-to-point -point wiring mostly under the chassis. On top you can see the seven tubes, power transformer, electrolytic filter capacitor, and some controls and switches. The underside of the chassis has most of the wiring with resistors, capacitors, power supply, filter choke, and remaining controls and switches. A heavy bus wire is used for connecting ground connections. Some wires are shielded. This unit was assembled reasonably well and no modifications are present. The builder marked the tubes and switches in pencil, presumably to aid in checking the assembly. There's no fuse and no grounding, but at least it used a power transformer which made it safer than some products like the All-American 5 radios of the time. Let's run through a demonstration of the unit operating. With no input signal, the output is a square wave at one of four frequencies. The exact frequency was not critical. My unit measures frequencies of about 200, 524, 1160, and 3706 Hz. The position control adjusts the relative amplitudes of the upper and lower portions of the square wave passing through zero and inverting them. When two input signals are applied, they're superimposed on the square wave. Here I've connected square and sine waves from a signal generator to the two inputs. Adjusting the gain controls adjusts the gain of each channel. In operation, we connect one of the sync outputs to the external sync input of the oscilloscope and adjust the sweep rate to get a suitable display. Doing that, the sine and square waves appear as two traces, even though the oscilloscope is only in single channel mode. The oscilloscope must be synchronized with one of the two signals, not the switching rate. The switch rates can be displayed for best display. If the switch rate and signal frequencies are harmonically related, the display will appear stationary and chopped. This is undesirable and to avoid it you choose a different switching rate. Here the two inputs are of the same frequency. If they were not the same or harmonically related to each other, then only the channel used for scope sync would be stable. The amplification performed by the switch means that the vertical scale is not calibrated. Often when using this, you only care about the horizontal timing relationship and not the vertical voltage level. Many scopes of the arrow were not even calibrated in the vertical scale. If you did want to measure signal voltages, one simple solution would be to measure and record the peak-to-peak -peak values of the input signals when directly coupled to the scope, one channel at a time, and then when using the switch, adjust the gain controls until the peak-to-peak -peak values are the same, in other words, a gain of one. The sync outputs simply amplify and buffer the inputs. Some earlier models of electronic switch did not provide sync outputs, and you simply used the input signal to sync which meant that they needed to have a large enough amplitude to sync the scope. The maximum frequency is rated at 100 kilohertz. This is quite conservatively rated at plus or minus one decibel, so it should actually be quite usable to 100 kilohertz, although waveforms like a square wave will be starting to lose harmonic content and getting rounded or distorted. 
On the low end, it can effectively go down to DC. It's important not to turn the gain up too high or it will distort the input signals. This unit was bought in September of 2015 on Kijiji from a local seller as part of a lot of four pieces of Heathkit test equipment. The units belonged to but were not built by his father. The seller's family lived near Benton Harbor, Michigan, the headquarters of Heathkit. It did not come with a manual and I was not able to find a manual online, but I found schematics and found a partial manual for the ID-22, which is electrically identical to the S3, the only difference is being cosmetic. After some visual inspection, the unit was powered up and seemed to work okay. Some controls were a little scratchy and some two pin connections possibly intermittent. Two of the knobs are not original and it has no feet. There's no handle on top, which is common as they were often removed so the units could be stacked. I cleaned the case inside and out and cleaned all contacts, controls and tube sockets. All the resistors measured okay, most had drifted a little high as is typical. The paper caps looked okay for leakage and the electrolytic caps had ESR values that were not too high. I was seeing the square wave output getting distorted on one side. It turned out that one of the paper caps was electrically leaking, putting the wrong DC bias on the grid of the tube. This was in a high impedance part of the circuit where there was a 10 megohm grid leak resistor to ground and any leakage will disturb the circuit. I replaced that cap and the matching one from the other half of the circuit with new ones. It seemed that the electrolytic filter cap might be getting warm, although it's hard to tell because it's located in between the power transformer and a tube. If so, it might be beginning to fail. If I was to use this unit on a regular basis, I would replace the electrolytic caps and paper caps. But in this case, I decided to keep it as original as possible while still getting it to work. This is the first electronic switch I've ever worked with. In the past, I was skeptical that these units were particularly useful and thought they were more of a gimmick. But it worked surprisingly well, and at the time, most scopes were single channel units with less than or about 100 kilohertz bandwidth, so this would quite effectively turn it into a two channel scope. The unit is about 60 years old with almost all the original components and still works. This is quite a testament to the robustness of the design and components. In contrast, the average lifetime of a smartphone in North America is about two years and getting shorter. I mentioned earlier that this type of unit is pretty much obsolete today. A similar device that does still exist is one that accepts several, often digital only inputs, maybe eight, and displays them as separate signals on a scope trace to effectively turn the scope into an eight channel logic analyzer. Circuits for doing this can still be found in books and hobbyist websites. You can learn more about electronic switches and other test equipment in my book, Classic Heathkit Electronic Test Equipment. The book covers Heathkit's test equipment products, starting with a brief history of Heathkit, an overview of the test equipment product lines, and tips on buying and restoring vintage test equipment from sources like eBay. Separate chapters cover the major categories of component testers and substitution boxes, frequency counters, meters, oscilloscopes, power supplies, signal generators, tube testers and checkers, and miscellaneous test equipment. Each chapter includes one or more in-depth sections that look at a representative model from my Heathkit collection, covering its features, operation, and notable quirks or trivia. The book is available from lulu.com and Amazon, and retails for US $19.95. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out my other YouTube videos on vintage radio and test equipment.